Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Tonight is a slightly different sort of like presentation. It is about Dataset, a tool that I've come across a wee while ago just by accident, and I thought it was worthwhile having a look at and then also sharing that. So, um, Dataset um, is basically a tool for exploring and publishing data according to their website. It's supposed to help people to take the data to the data take the data of any shape, uh, being able to analyze and explore it, and then also in theory to publish it as an interactive website, and including like an API for it. Um, and it's aimed at data journalists, museum curators, archivists, local government scientists, researchers, and anyone who else has data that they wish to share with the world. It's a very nice introduction, to be honest. Um, they probably wrote that. Um, in a few iterations to write that one. So how does it work? Um, well, it's web browser based. Um, so you run things nicely in a web platform um, that works and uh, you can just use it and access it from anywhere, especially if you deploy it to a host of website then. Um, by default, especially when you're developing, it uses SQLite databases as a backend. And that means you can basically run SQL queries to generate tabular data, which then can be displayed in a table, um, looked at, um, and then further worked with, and then potentially also plotted and things like that. It has quite a number of uh, plugins. I'm going to show some things regarding geospatial data. Um, it offers also a JSON API where you can access the data then and retrieve data from it. So it doesn't have to be just through the web interface. Um, so you can deploy it locally, for instance, on a Linux box via systemd, or on um, cloud services like Heroku or Google Cloud Run, there's a few other ones that it supports as well. And you can have um, customized sort of like page templates and all kinds of other things. Um, it has a lot of settings that you can set, and it's quite a lot of things to look at. So it's been around for a while, and um, yeah, it seems quite interesting. Um, when I first started with the tool, I couldn't get it to work. It just wouldn't want me, it just wouldn't allow me to import any data. And I think I may have just run afoul with the Pandas 2.0 release, um, that this was breaking a lot of other things. Um, so by downgrading Pandas uh, to something below 2, all of some things worked. So the things that I've found actually useful, um, tools slash plugins, um, was CSVs to SQLite. That allows you to turn CSV files into a SQLite database. GeoJSON um, to SQLite. Um, that basically turns any GeoJSON data then also in a SQLite database that you can then use as a basis for dataset. Dataset Vega, that was a little plugin so you can immediately plot your tabular data like a bar plot, line plot, or a scatter plot that it offers. And it nicely exports things then to, for instance, a PNG or SVG as well. And then dataset cluster map, that was um, a little plugin where you can create cluster maps of GIS data. So if you have your, if your data in a table contains like latitude and longitude that automatically basically displays then a uh, map then with that. So here were a few um, sort of like minimal requirements um, that you needed to have. Pandas less than two. Click, that's sort of like a tool for building command line, um, uh, sort of a command line stuff, like similar to ArcPass. Um, and dataset Vega, CSVs to SQLite, and GeoJSON to uh, SQLite, so a particular set of versions there. Right, so that's it for the introduction there. So I know it's not a lot, um, it's more really about a hands on demo here. So I'll be um, sharing my screen. Oh, is that coming through? Yeah, you see a bash? Yeah. Cool, okay. Excellent. So I'm just 
Um, but it's not me that dropped you out of full screen, is it? Make full screen. Oh. Yep. Okay. Visible? Yep. We dropped oh. out of full screen, but now we're well. Oh, okay. We're back to full screen. Okay. Good. So I have. I basically just um, going to remove that virtual environment. So it's um, basically just going to create it from scratch. Um, pip um, and oh, actually, so here's my minimal requirements that I had earlier uh, in the presentation. So I'm just going to install those. What's click? It's something similar to ArcPass. Oh, okay. For, it's the processing command line. Yes, yeah. Um, but it's supposedly to be better. So I came across, oh, what was that? That was with another tool that I was presenting a couple of months ago. Um, they were using Click as well. Um, mm -hmm. There was, um, I think there was the web interface builder there um, that was using Click as well. Anyway, so if we are doing a pip freeze now, we're getting quite a bit more now. Um, here's click in there. Um, so here's data set, what not, RCSVs. Um, yeah, and a few other things. And you can see that it's using UVCorn. Um, so I can now basically um, start data set up, um, go on a browser, and then basically give a, get a web interface like this. Um, not overly useful because I haven't got any data, right? So um, I'm just going to close it. So I have um, in my data directory, I'm just going to remove those, um, I have going to start with the iris data set. So this is a very simple data set. It's about three types of irises. Um, and that's a data set that the famous statistician Fisher in, I think, 1936 or so compiled. Um, so nearly 100 years old now. And it, if you do anything machine learning, you always come across this as a um, simple data set for classification because it has three classes, iris setosa, Iris versicolor color and uh, Iris virginica. And um, you have sort of like length and width of sepals and petals. Um, and that got collected. So it has 50 data points per um, Iris variety. And we can now turn that. I'm just going to. Um, so I can then basically um, turn that with a simple command into a database. So um, actually, okay. So if I go up, um, um, I'm going to remove my Iris SQLite database. Um, so I'm going then to um, use CSVs to SQLite. So I can basically just then point it to a CSV file. And um, I want to use, oops, turn that into a database. And that was the problem that, that was the thing that didn't work for me because of using pandas for reading CSVs and turns that then basically into SQLite database. So there was a problem with that. Um, I mean, you can see there's already some future warnings in there and whatnot. Um, so that's probably something that then no longer worked. Um, I'm just going to remove some other 
databases which I'll be recreating. Um, okay. All right. Okay, so now we have an iris database. Um, and if I rerun um, my, that's probably easier, just rerunning thing, data set, and then go in my data directory and just say, oh, please use my iris database as a base. So running on the same port. So if I refresh that, I now have here my iris listed. I can now click on that, and then I can basically run SQL query. So in this case, select star from iris, and then I get basically here that particular list. Um, but if I go back, I already have here sort of like a predefined one. That's the table, and if I go on that, you get a slightly nicer one. Um, so you can sort via raw ID and whatnot. Um, so you can sort, for instance, ascending or descending. You can facet by this. So facet basically just means having a subset um, sort of like, or you facet sort of like basically grouping based on values. Um, and um, so, yeah, so you can see that. So. You see a button here, sort of like show charting options. If I click on that, so this is the data set Vega plugin. And I can then, for instance, do a scatter plot, which then automatically pops up there. But I want, for instance, sepal length, which is numeric, versus petal length. And since we also have um, class information, I want to have that in terms of coloring. And you can see, oh, why is it now actually only displaying two classes despite us actually having three? Um, if I go on view and edit SQL, I can see that they're limiting it to 101. So if I remove that, um, then I basically get that. Or if I limit 150. I get that. Um, that's one thing I've never really understood why you sometimes get this, but not the other times. But um, if we go back on the charting options, and then sepal length, numeric versus petal length, and then use the class, then we can see that we have three distinct colors here, and you can see there's basically really um, so. The iris setosa is quite different from these up here, and um, the versicolor and virginica are slightly overlapping, but you can still sort of like separate that relatively easily. And then if you, um, you can then easily also save it as a PNG or as an SVG. I mean, that plot is quite small, so that's why saving as an SVG is actually quite nice. So if I bring that up, then I can easily blow that up and I always have a nice plot that I can then, for instance, um, embed in other documents or websites if I want to do that, if I don't want to use dataset itself. So this is sort of like a really easy um, way of plotting things. Um, we um, I go back. I go back to this. Um, so you can also do subclassing here, for instance, um, either via up here, or if I, for instance, want to look at just one particular um, iris variety. So I click or facet this, and it tells me, okay, you have 50 for each, and I can click on that, and that basically gives me a subset of 50 rows just with that. 
And if I then do once again a scatter plot, and also sepal length versus petal length, in class, of course, won't be interesting anymore because there's only a single one. But I can then easily sort of like look at how things change um, within, oops, generic, how things change within that particular um, class. So I can do things in here. So using it by, for this particular data set is probably not so interesting. Um, it's probably for other ones that are a bit more challenging. And with those axes, you can basically always take off these facets. Then again, um, yeah, and then I can also um, export this data easily. Um, so if uh, this data is JSON, then I see automatically that sort of like, oops, that's the, you can see in the URL then that you can just request the um, JSON format of the data set. And if you use CSV, then you basically get the data set that's underlying that particular view as well. And that's then our, in this case, also the only the 100 um, rows that we can see here. And then, yeah, so you can sort of like do next page then, and then you see more of that. So quite quite simple, sort of like if you want to, um, if you have, um, so for instance, um, bar plots or line plots would be um, interesting if you have like a time series. So for instance, in case for you, Ian, if you're doing your little heart monitor thing, and if mm. you're storing that in a SQLite database somewhere, then you could have that sort of like as a, as a, um, front end on top and then visualize things easily. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and um, I have a few more data sets here. Um, so I was um, one, um, so with, I think one was the student performance here. So I can turn that. Um, CSVs to SQLite, so it's students' performance CSV, um, and then students' performance DB. Cool. And rather than just RSDB, I can either list them or just use shell expansion and sort of like to have all my um, databases then listed. And then I automatically see basically students' performance then. And it's nice, it's sort of like you can have multiple tables in one of these databases, of course, and it gives you um, a quick sort of like overview of what the fields are in there. And in this case, for instance, um, so um, it automatically suggests some facets to use. Um, so for instance, I can uh, facet by gender, and then I could look at female and male, and then, for instance, start at charting some things. Um, so if we are, oh, where do we start with? Um, we're looking parental level of education and what do they get in their math score? Um, and we use a bar plot and scatter plot. Let's use the scatter plot here. So you can then see, I'll make that a bit larger here. So you can see you have an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, high school, master's degree, and whatnot. Um, so that was the parental level and some high schools. So you can see that there are um, things shift a bit and they have probably a wider range in um, certain things. So, but if we use um, the, so that was for females. If we're doing the same for male, we have the parental level of education and then have the math score. 
Um, so we can see that there are differences. So for instance, with the bachelor's degree is much narrower with the, the males versus the females. So, um, so you can see that there are differences in the cohorts, whether you're looking at, at the particular gender here. And if you're looking at the URL now, um, that's sort of like you can see, oh, we have query parameters. So here's a facet based on gender and the gender is male. And then other things are sort of like here, the um, how it's being plotted. So if I can basically then have this just in another, um, I can basically just use that URL and look at it um, sort of like, so I can send that to someone else. Hey, look at this for instance. Um, what was there one thing? Large now. So if I, I want to use the gender as a coloring option. Uh, well, actually, if I use parental level and use the math score, so you can also then, if you use once again, sort of like the gender as, as coloring in, then you can see that they're in one graph, that there are differences. Um, but you can also then look, are there changes in ethnicity, really? So in this case, um, it's mean in one plot, having five different ethnicities in there is not really easy to say. So it's probably not particularly useful in this case. Probably just leave it at gender. It's easier to determine. Um, so if we're looking at the reading score, um, females seem to be scoring better than males. If the parents have at least some um, kind of college. Um, if you're looking at the writing score, that's also higher up. Um, so yeah, so if you just have high school, that looks like the males are doing worse as well. So yeah, so another way of, of plotting some things um, in easy plots. Um, if we are closing it again. Um, the next thing was then actually doing some geospatial stuff and the cluster map I thought was actually quite an interesting one and a long time ago um, there was a data set I was looking for sort of about um, cities around the world that had latitude and longitude information and this is sort of like the um, um, City, uh, country, cities, or uh, countries, states, cities. I actually named it the wrong way, but that's okay. Um, database, data set. I might maybe rename that here properly. So I can recreate that. So it has three sets. One is countries, states is basically, in, in New Zealand's probably sort of like the regions like the Waikato, uh, Northland and so on that you would have. Um, and then we can um, import that. So the cities, we, so it's another argument to, if you want to import multiple things, so rather than using, for instance, this is the file name, you can also give it particular table names. Um, and then we call it the countries, um, states, cities.tv oh, of course not yeah, and then, okay that's one so that's cities states and countries All right. Let's start up it again. And now we can see we have countries, states, and cities. 
And I can basically look at those three different um, subsets. So there you have <laughs> the cities, you can see many rows, uh, countries where you have 250 rows in that one and states 5,000 already. So that's um, using then the cluster map. So that's using the leaflet um, plugin here. So you can then see um, the different countries that you have here. So then you can always see sort of like what um, polygon those uh, latitudes and longitudes are actually then encompassing. So if we go looking here sort of like in um, down our end, then we have here one country in which is New Zealand. Uh, we have the New Zealand dollar there, currency, uh, top level domain is .nz, it's region Oceania. Um, and um, further down, we basically see the full table here. Um, and what you can see in the pop-up, it's basically just all these different attributes that we have for the table here. It's down here. I can easily um, see, so yeah, so you even have, um, looks like that's the flags that we have here. And um, yeah, over here we have basically latitude and longitude. Um, where it is, and this is the region, I believe, here. Sorry. Bear with me for a sec. Yeah, so region. So for instance, if I just wanted to have a subset, um, so region is Oceania, and then I can apply that, then yeah, I'm basically just getting Oceania here in this world map. And then I have 27 here, so American Samoa, Australia, Christmas Island, and so on. And um, yes, yeah, so if we click over here, Pitcairn Islands, even French Polynesia, Cook Islands, and then here Samoa, American Samoa, Wallis Fortuna, and so on. So yeah, and and the nice thing with the cluster map is. That depending on how you zoom out, you basically see different sets, and it makes sometimes sort of like zooming in a bit easier. So rather than having millions of these um, map pointers sitting there, you actually see just the ones that you want to. And I mean, if you go for cities, there's going to be a lot more, and that really just um, so if you look at the SQL again, it just returns the first hundred and one. Um, so that's not very um, useful. So that's for um, um, limiting um, the country. Um, this country. And remove the limit and then run the SQL. Um, country name. Okay. Should have looked at the SQL first. Yeah, so when you look at it, um, actually, so you see there's a um, Chatham Islands <laughs> as well, <laughs> but further out. And then you can see as you zoom in that you see more and more. Uh, there's Gisborne. But you can tell that the underlying map already has a lot more cities, and especially. Um, there's a few more than 158 cities um, in New Zealand, but it's quite possible that that depends on the um, size. So um, in order to be considered a city, so I'm not sure whether that's like at least, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 people living there. So that would no, I thought possible. it was a town until it became 20,000. Then it was called a city. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure what this is based on because it's really just a subset. I mean, Oputiki is on there, which is not really that large, I thought. Um, yeah. But then uh, Morrinsville is not in there. So I have Morrinsville. really no 
Cambridges. Yeah, so it's 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 a little bit strange, but I mean, it's just just an example showing sort of like what you can do. And the nice thing is by having it in the browser, you basically get those tiles in for free. I mean, you can see down here that it's just using OpenStreetMap with a layer basically on top, the leaflet layer. Um, yeah, so I mean, Auckland is here still as multiple cities. Um, so, but yeah, so there, there's that. So that's this is um, so if if whoops, if we are uh, um, just looking at the look at the kind of oops, um, this uh, CSC cities. We're just looking at that. So this has basically a latitude and longitude um, column in there. Um, if that weren't the case, then you could specify that either globally for your data set instance, um, if you have multiple um, databases on there that always use the same, or you can also do it then per database that you define what um, the names are basically in these columns to automatically detect that then. Um, I kill that. Um, so there was um, GeoJSON was another one then. Um, there was something that I downloaded from um, the data portal that the government provides. So there's a healthy rivers monitoring um, nodes um, and um, that comes uh, is available in GeoJSON format. Um, so I'm just gonna um, import that. So we have our healthy CSV. Um, I'm gonna import that into healthy rivers. And that's the GeoJSON one. Oh, what am I doing? We want to use that, that database and, and that Healthy Rivers table with that GeoJSON data. All right. And one minute again. Okay, here's our Healthy Rivers now. There's that particular Healthy Rivers table. And that uses now the GeoJSON um, sort of like plugin there to display these things. It's slightly different, um, also using Leaflet, but slightly different sort of like uh, display. So um, that's on, I think, the Healthy Rivers sort of like because it was a Waikato one um, data set. That's the Waikato River, I think, mostly around that area. Um, and see the various um, monitoring sites. So here's one, Peacock's Road, um, Hamilton Traffic Bridge, uh, Edgecombe Street, Sahara, oops. And up the Horatio Bridge. So there's an Arawahi, I guess. Oh, yeah, Confluence of Waipa and Waikato River. Yeah, so you can then sort of like see these things if you have um, data that you could, for instance, ingest, and they can easily display things like that with the metadata that comes with it, which is quite nice. And if you have multiple tables and whatnot, you, can, you just need to basically construct a SQL query that compiles all the data that you want to show because you don't necessarily want to display everything. Um, and you can basically use then that. Um, you can hide columns and whatnot and then just use the things that you want to display to the public. Um, so yeah, so that was that. And I have one last one, which was the biodiversity vegetation. There was um, also from the data portal. 
That's a slightly larger one. It has quite a few rows in there. If you look at the file size, that's 160 megabytes. So it takes a wee while um, generating. Oh, that's done. Let's go back. And now we have our biodiversity. You can see here yeah, many rows again. <laughs> and it's quite good because by default it just shows 100 or so by default. And the great thing of having these um, plugins, you can immediately see Oops, uh, these uh, plugins for maps. You can just nicely visualize things even if it's just a subset. Um, and you can see, oh, okay, so forest harvested and blah and whatnot. So let's have a look. I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller. So you can have. Oops. So LCDB, that's sort of like land cover database. That's a different ways of um, classifying things. So I'd like to, for instance, facet by the top level one. So we have basically then these ones so shrubland planted forest indigenous forest and so on coastal wetland mangrove so i'd be interested actually in seeing mangrove actually um, so i can just go on to mangrove and then i can see oops, the only places seems to be up there where we actually have mangroves then fungamata up there, um, Parnoy, Ira, and I think over there, where is that? Oh, yeah, here. Or not here, coming down here, so. Yeah, kind of river. At the first, yeah, sort of like, yeah, very sort of like shallow and whatnot, where they like to grow. Yeah, so you can look at this then, and yeah, so you can. Um, easily sort of like drill down here and then just display these things so I can then easily get rid of that again or if I'm most uh, more in oh, let's have a look at inland wetlands then you can see well definitely inland ones here around Lake Taupo mostly from the looks of it that we know of um, what is down there herbaceous freshwater vegetation so that's then little things that got classified as wetlands and then yeah if you want to see so there's nearly 1200 um, entries there so if we um, go back on that facet and then looking at indigenous forests so there's a bit more um, and we probably want to remove um, that and make, oops, ah. and we want to maybe sort of like limit that to a particular district. Um, so, whoops, um, so we can do district equals, oops. Apply that. So we can there's 336, but I think oh, that might actually return, be returning them all of them now. Let's have a look what we get around the Y cutter. Uh, so there's zero records because it doesn't find it. So because that district doesn't exist. So if I go back and remove all of those. Uh, and then just go on my um, 
Let's remove my head. Oops. Uh, and I want something a little bit for large tables. It's sometimes a little bit hard to get to um, in the browser because it's sort of like. Uh, oops. Yeah. Because that large table is not very. That's one problem that I've encountered that when you have so much being displayed, it can be really tricky finding things that you're after. District. Oh. How about we use Hamilton? Um, so we want to. Get over again. One up facet. Um, so we want to do district Hamilton apply. We do have a lot less. We can then see the different things that we have here. So if we look, what is this? So this are deciduous hardwoods that we have here. Um, Cities hardwoods. Um, what do we have? What do we have here? If we're looking at that top level classification, so we have one wetland, which is interesting. Huh, that is all right. Oh yes, that's over there. That way. Um, that's where the that's the bird park that will disappear, unfortunately, due to the um, bypass thing here. Um, then there's um, indigenous forests, of which we apparently have ten. So that over there, which one is that? Is that T Papa Nui forest on um, near Cleveland, isn't it? That showed up. You know, there's that little bush walk you can do in that one here. Forest, I think it is. Beechwood, be mostly. The Cleveland's, yep, that shows up. And then there's another one here. Is that the um, uh, subtle, yeah, subtle school? Yep, and then here's another one, Peach Grove. Right, so, I mean, you can see it's not a lot really anymore in Hamilton itself. Uh, if you're looking at indigenous forests, there's only 10, so, but yeah. Anyway, so that, I thought that was quite handy, sort of like for drilling down things, and it allows you, um, so if you have data, then to, um, deploy that also and people can just play around with it. I mean, if you have it on one of those, um, like Heroku or something, because unfortunately Heroku now has removed, I think it's free um, tier um, when I had a look. Um, so I actually have to uh, put my credit card in in order to deploy anything. Um, so you could easily sort of like deploy your um, database there and you could have that there. Uh, and then every now and then basically probably just update things and make your data available. And it's great sort of like if it's geospatial data. Um, I could imagine that um, city councils or um, district boards, um, sort of like district council could actually um, find that quite useful for doing that because I mean, it's easy enough for them to export um, geospatial data and you don't have to, to actually use ArcGIS in order to display anything like that um, and people can export the data as well so it would be I would say a relatively cost-effective way of exporting um, their data and making it available to the public but, hmm. anyway so that was um, all that I've gone through for today I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and yeah, so 
Does anyone have any questions? Um, I'm just wondering, what, what's the actual Python module that um, takes the CSV file and sticks it into the um, SQL DB database? So that was the CSVs to SQLite to um, and let me have a look. Um, is that part of the, uh, No, that's actually a separate tool that they just use. And I think um, they just make, um, so make, they basically combine a lot of these tools yeah. um, to make it easy to really um, work with data because, so I'll just put that in there in the chat. Um, sees these to SQLite so that um, um, just a number of these tools um, to populate your data or your database and then once you have that then you can then work on your um, queries to get the data that you want to display and then you can deploy that and people can also then because the database is then also online you can then also look at um, explore the data or try different plots and whatnot and simply explore things. And that makes it really great um, as a tool. So there are actually, I mean, I think CSV, CSVs to SQLite and then the GeoJSON to SQLite, they're really separate tools. And um, by um, starting off basically using SQLite, it's easy enough for a data set to just draw on such a big pool of um, database tools that are actually out there uh, for using them. And I think as far as I know, so looking at through some of the documentation, you don't have to use SQLite. You can just use other uh, SQL databases as well in order to base that on. But I think SQLite is easy enough. You can just run it locally. You don't need um, any admin rights and whatnot to even um, uh, sort of like get the database going you can just write, install that basically create a virtual environment install data sets install some tools and you can uh, import your data and then do stuff with it and even if you are only generating sort of like some visualizations with it um, yeah i mean it's easy enough um, for you to recreate it because you can record the commands that you ran in order to create the database and then you know oh these are the SQL queries um, in order to get that particular plot and that's it so it's very easy to recreate again um, and I mean by running in the browser it's nice so um, isn't uh, isn't really a huge to me that SQL like was usable with GIE data um i i don't think so it has a particular plugin i think they're just um i mean we could open one of those um smaller ones the geojson ones um the healthy river ones um so that has basically just one table um and it has actually ge geomet the, you know, the um, data types you can use in SQLite. Yeah. Um, I didn't think so that you could, but um, we have NZTMX and Y. I think that would be latitude and longitude, but in a New Zealand context, yeah. the, ge oops, the geometry, that is actually um, what the geojson then is. That's a point, and here are the coordinates. Um, and I think that's being fed. Um, so it's really just a text field. So it's nothing fancy. It's just being stored like that. And I think it's basically really just being fed into the um, leaflet. Um, sorry, I should actually share my screen. Ah. All right. Apologies for that. Right. So. Um, F to, so if we are looking at the geo, oops, 
actually quite a light one. Um, yeah, so that's basically the tool that is being used for that. And if I open that database um, for the Healthy Rivers one, um, so you can see that it has um, object ID, name, location, key, and whatnot, and then um, New Zealand sort of like base coordinates, <clears throat> and some comments and whatnot. And if you look at the geometry then here, um, then you can see it's really just JSON in here. So it really just imports the JSON geometry. And I think this is then what's being just fed into the leaflet overlay. And that then makes use of um, the geometry in there and um, displays things accordingly. So this is then basically handled by a JavaScript plugin in the browser. So in that sense, SQLite is really just used as a simple um, data storage in that sense. So it's not really GIS functionality in that sense. Yeah. Um, it just has rows in there. And because you're constructing your SQL query uh, based on other fields and whatnot, don't think so that, I mean, you could, in this case, you could use the NZTM and NZTMY um, fields to restrict that. Um, but you wouldn't be able to do something like, oh, around this coordinate with a radius of 50 kilometers, something that you would be able to do with PostgreSQL if you have GIS plugins, yeah. where you can do these queries on there. So this, um, I think, is much, much easier. But depending, I mean, because you're displaying it and not running difficult queries or computationally expensive queries, uh, I think it's easy enough just for exploratory. Um, tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was quite handy. I mean, um, just having sort of like these little tools there to populate your database makes it just really easy to use something. I mean, once you get over the problem of pandas two not quite working with things because I mean if um, the um, CSVs to SQLite the last update was last year and uh, sorry um, that was in 2021 the last time it actually had an update so pandas has changed in the last one and a half years quite a bit so um, not surprised that it causes problems because when I was trying to import my CSV files, it just wouldn't do anything. It always ended up um, imported zero data frames, like so that's not very useful. I mean, if lo reading the description sort of like it is, um, it has in the description says browse and publish uh, sort of like convert CSV files into a SQLite database and then browse and publish that SQLite database with data set. So it's possible that they created that tool um, or whether it, I'm not quite sure whether they created the tool or whether um, they simply um, then made use of that. And then the authors of the CSVs to SQLite then, oh, they're using it, so I can just advertise with that. I'm not sure what came first, um, chicken or the egg. Um, but yeah. Yes, interesting. I, I think, you know, the sort of default with a CSV, if you're looking at data, mm. thing like Excel. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, but personally, I don't really enjoy using Excel. But, um, <laughs> yeah, same here. So, <laughs> and I mean, I sort of like having a data science background, I just prefer being able to run my SQL queries yeah. and then I know what I, what I've done and filtered on because with, with Excel, it sometimes does so many autos, auto, auto magic stuff where you don't know why is this happening. I mean, the usual problem, why did it convert this to a date column? This is not a date at all. And then <laughs> things like that, or you can hide things and then display other things and whatnot. So that does, it can be really problematic. So, and having this then really sort of like, yep, back to basics, 
here's a database that you can import data to and from a date sort of like from a database authoring point of view you can also then control what data goes in that um, and then if you basically automate that process and then you can just always deploy basically new versions of that whenever there's new data coming around um, and it's it doesn't have to be hosted on your systems like it's if it's hosted on Heroku you just sort of like pay for it as and how many users are basically accessing um, the database now incurring costs for running sort of like that particular service then in the CPU compute that's necessary then but it's it's quite cool so and by displaying things um, in in the browser so in, in a sense it's 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 a dumb data sort of like provider and a lot of the CPU cycles will be spent in on the client side in the browser for displaying the maps, pulling in the maps. So you're not hosting the map data that's hosted by OpenStreetMap. You just basically are supplying the thin layer on top with the information um, to display stuff. So from that point of view, it should be quite cost effective um, actually having that hosted then as well. And yeah, you don't have to use tools commercial tools like ArcGIS in order to display your data. Yeah, that's quite useful. Mm. Yeah, um, any other questions? No, I think <clears throat> I'm happy at the moment. Yep. All right, in that case, we can probably um, stop the uh, recording then, Ian. Yeah. Okay.